Hello. I'm Lauren. I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. dark. Paradise After Dark is a bi-weekly podcast covering true crime, unsolved mysteries, missing people, urban legends, and the dark side of the Sunshine State. If you'd like to support the show and get a bunch of extra Paradise After Dark content, sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Paradise After Dark podcast. Yes, and visit our website where you'll find links to our episodes, our mailing list, uh, social medias, and our Patreon. We also have a virtual tip jar now, so leave us a tip if you want a shout out on the show. Speaking of tips, we have a shout out from Donna K in Jacksonville. Thank you, who, Donna. She writes us and says, first drinks at CrimeCon are on me. Thank oh, you, Donna. Thank you, Donna. <laughs> Let's see what else we we got any other news? I know we crime didn't cons have any crime cons in less than a month. That's awesome! I'm stoked. I know. I'm so excited. I am so stoked. excited. Um, I guess I, I'm ready to like meet. I mean, you know, meet a bunch of different people. Maybe meet some new people. But of course, our old our old friends, the OGs. The OGs. Some of the OGs. I saw on Facebook that some are going to be there, so I'm excited for that. Yeah, me too. So let's get into it. You ready to get into our case? Yeah. Um. Tonight is a case that uh, came in as a suggested case for us. Yes. This case comes out of Polk County, Florida, particularly a little tiny town called Alturas. It's been called one of the most disturbing murders in central Florida history. It was sneaky, it was disturbing, and it was evil. And the Sun Sentinel says in an article on the crime, what the crime lacked in violence was made up for its blatant pointlessness and the smug audacity of its perpetrator. So, I'm just going to dive into it here. This goes back to, what, the fall of 1988? Yes. The series of events that led to the murder of Peggy Carr began in the small town of Alturas, Florida. This is where Peggy and Pie Carr and four of their five children lived in a home tucked among the lakes, ranches, and citrus groves south of Route 60 between Bartow and Lake Wales, Florida. It was a rural area. In fact, the car's house was so isolated that their only neighbors were a couple named George and Diana Trepel. So this is Polk County, 1988 rural Polk County. Yes. I mean, Polk County is still kind of rural now, so just envision... Even even more so, I guess, because I guess depending on where you are in Polk County. So envision if you've listened to our episode about the Polk County Massacre yeah. and Frostproof, Florida. It's the same setup, but maybe just a little bit more rural than it is now. It yeah. hasn't, I don't think it's really changed much. Not too much, but 1988, that just to kind of set the scene. I mean, remember, it's not, this isn't like a booming, Polk County is not a... a this area of Polk County, I should say, rather, is not a booming area. No. And it definitely wasn't in 1988. And it so. was isolated. Where they lived was very isolated. I think their nearest neighbors, besides the Tree Pals, was about a quarter of a mile away. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So there's some good distance there. Well, Peggy, Peggy Carr, she was at work in late October at the Nicholas Family Restaurant in nearby Bartow when she felt a strange series of pains in her chest. Now, Peggy and her daughter, Sissy, worked together as waitresses, and she told her daughter that she thought she was having a heart attack. I guess she was having symptoms, that pain, if you will. Now, Peggy went home, but when the pain became unbearable, Pi drove her to Bartow Memorial Hospital. Now, as she laid on a gurney in the emergency room, Peggy told the doctor, I feel like I'm on fire. Now, the ER physicians couldn't find a cause for her pain. One doctor told Peggy her symptoms were psychosomatic. Nonetheless, they kept her in the hospital for observation for three days, and her condition seemed to improve a little bit, so she was sent home. So the family assumed that Peggy had just come down with some kind of stomach bug, so she was at home drinking Coke after Coke to try and settle her stomach. Now, do you remember when you were little, if you had like the flu or an upset stomach? I I don't know about you, but like my mom would give me these little medicine cups Filled with Coca-Cola. Yeah. yeah. And it's supposed to settle your stomach. Exactly. Coke. Well, I think now also they use um, like the ginger ale and crackers. Yeah. But a little side note here. Um, actually, footnote or what do they call it? Fun fact. Fun a little fact. fun fact. Fun fact time. In 
Dr. Pepper, which is actually, when you're talking about Dr. Pepper, was actually made by a pharmacist who, a doctor, if you will, he called it Dr. Pepper because it contained pepsin, which is like a, a digestive enzyme that helps your stomach. You know, the pepsin, which is like Pepsi, AC, things like that. So technically speaking, the soda in and of itself does sort of have a healing effect. Does it still have pepsin in it? Yeah, I believe so. Dr. Pepper? Yeah. You know what the other thing is? Most people don't know what, what the base of Dr. Pepper is. It's, it's black cherry. I, I, can, I can get on board with that. Well, if you look at the can, you can actually see them. They're kind of faint. There's also a 10, 2, and 4 on there. You know what the 10, 2, and 4 means? On the can? Yeah. What? That's Dr. Pepper. Back in the day, you were supposed to drink Dr. Pepper at 10, 2, and 4, 10 a.m., 2 p.m., and 4, 4 p.m. It was supposed to like help you with energy. Like It was kind of like the original energy drink, but they told you what time to drink it. Great marketing ploy. I guess. So, okay, fun fact. So over. back to what we were talking about. Uh, Peggy assume, assumed she had a stomach bug, so she was drinking Coca Cola to try and settle her stomach. That's when Peggy's son Dwayne and Pie's son Travis also started to complain about tingling fingers, upset stomachs, and burning sensations throughout their body. Now, within days, Peggy's symptoms had returned too. Carolyn Dixon, Pi Carr's sister, who was also a nurse, knew something was terribly wrong. So this time, Peggy was rushed by ambulance to Winter Haven Hospital, which is a much bigger hospital than Bartow, yes. where she went the first time. So after running some routine tests, Dr. T. Richard Hostler, a neurologist, and Dr. Robert Van Hook, an infectious disease specialist, discussed Peggy's symptoms. Hostler had a hunch that Peggy's pain was being caused by some kind of poison. Because Peggy's hair was falling out, he suspected the poison was thallium. So thallium is a tasteless and odorless chemical and is a member of the aluminum family. It was discovered in 1861. Doctors began using it to treat syphilis, gonorrhea, dysentery, gout, and other afflictions. So they just poisoned people when they had illnesses? I guess so. <laughs> in, the eight, in the 1800s, maybe. I don't know. This is why I'm grateful for medical advances. But thallium had a toxic side effect, causing nerves and muscles to shrivel and die. By the 1960s, the chemical was mostly used as a pesticide to kill everything from cockroaches to rats. Its toxicity prompted the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to outlaw its widespread use in 1972. Nevertheless, to test his theory, Hostler had a sample of Peggy's urine flown to a lab in Atlanta, and the results confirmed his suspicion. Testing on the boys, Dwayne and Travis, turned up enough thallium to keep them hospitalized for months while Peggy slipped into a coma. So the, 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 the kids were hospitalized, obviously, for a long period of time. But Peggy had so much in her system that she was in a coma now. She went into a coma. So Peggy and her family had been poisoned. So the thallium poisoning. Thallium poison, hmm. yes. So the doctors notified the Polk County Sheriff's Office, and homicide detective Ernie Mincy was assigned to investigate case quickly involved into an attempted murder investigation. That's when Brad Brecky, an FBI agent assigned to the Lakeland Field Office, joined the investigation. Well, see, that's one thing that confused me, and maybe you can help me out, because I couldn't... Why would the FBI come in if this was a attempted homicide or attempted murder? Well, I believe that they were concerned. Now, this is 1988, and... You remember the Tylenol murders in 19... Was it 84, 83? 82. 82. So I believed at, at the very beginning they thought that it was some sort of product tampering because representatives of the Polk County Health Department and the Florida Department of Health and Rehabilitation Services and the EPA searched the car's home and after ruling out contamination in the family's well water and testing hundreds of items from the home, detectives uncovered traces of thallium in some empty bottles of Coca-Cola. Okay, that makes sense. So they were 
worried about product tampering like in the Tylenol murders back in 1982. Because when that happened, that became so that that was sort of that's a federal offense. Yes. Because if you're they didn't know if it happened maybe at the bottling or Coca-Cola or right. if someone had legitimately caused this problem. Right. Okay. And then remember Peggy had been drinking Coca-Cola to try and settle her stomach back when she thought she had a stomach bug. So there was three glass bottles left in the eight pack. That's how they used to be packaged. Eight packs? Mm-hmm. They were eight packs of glass bottles with the tops that you actually need a bottle opener to open. Mm-hmm. I remember those days. There were no fingerprints on the remaining bottles, but under a powerful microscope, investigators discovered tiny scratch marks on the metal cap, an indication that they had been meticulously removed and replaced. The remaining soda was tested and found to contain a gram of thallium each. Holy cow. Enough to kill an adult. So the strange thing here was that thallium usually uses causes a carbonated drink to fizz and overflow. And it also changes the color and leaves a noticeable sediment in the bottom of the container. Who So whoever concocted this particular batch of thallium did so in a way that avoided these issues. So avoided, so somebody had to know what they were doing to make it. Right. Whoever made the stallion was very knowledgeable on the subject. So this, along with professional removal and reattachment of the bottle caps, obviously you're dealing with someone who is very meticulous, very intelligent so that's a good form of how how thallium works or chemistry in and of itself works right so the fbi who was now involved as we mentioned knew this was not the work of an amateur well march 3rd of 1989 when peggy carr was removed from life support and died it became now a homicide investigation so now it's no longer an attempted murder we're dealing with a homicide. Right. So then the question becomes, who would want to poison Peggy and basically her whole family? So we're looking, now we're looking for a murder suspect. So first, as is the case and with most murders, detectives looked at those closest to the family. It's always the husband. They learned that Peggy and Pi, still newlyweds, were already having marriage trouble. Pi was actually having an affair with an old girlfriend. Now, when Peggy found out about this affair, she left him for a brief period of time, but soon moved back in. Now, it was only days after she moved back in with Pi that she fell ill for the first time. Very suspicious, suspicious indeed. The first time Peggy got sick, Pi was away on a hunting trip. Hmm. When he returned home, he did not take her illness seriously and told the children it was probably just a virus, and he refused to take her to the hospital. So one of her children is actually who drove her to the hospital the first time. It's kind of looking suspicious at this point. All of this added up did not look good for Pi. But when the entire family underwent testing for thallium, doctors found insignificant traces of poison in Pi car his daughter, Tammy, Peggy's daughter, Galena, and her two-year-old granddaughter, Casey. So everyone. Everyone in the family, except for one of Pi's daughters, because she only drank diet soda. Oh, okay. She's the only one that had no thallium in her system. And, and really, why would Pi poison himself and his own children and all the children just to kill Peggy. It doesn't it doesn't really Well that's not I don't know. So he poisoned himself. Well, he had the poison in his system. Okay, let me ask you a question though. Would this be a good tactic for someone who was gonna poison someone or poison your family? Would it be a good tactic to supply yourself with a small amount of the poison? If you knew it wasn't going to kill you, so that way you would be you you would be canceled as a suspect. 
Well, because the thallium was found in Pi's system, investigators no longer considered him a suspect. That's what I'm saying. So they didn't dig it. So, so what do you do? So, okay, I'm going to poison myself just a wee little bit. Not enough to kill me, but enough to make me sick to where they'll find it in my system. They'll never suspect me. Now, that would be something that would require somewhat of intelligence who maybe is smart enough to know that the way the chemicals work, uh, would have the meticulous capability of recapping the bottles, would know maybe a thallium. So it's a possibility. So I'm just saying, at this it's, point, it's still a possibility investigators this ruled point. him out, but they, so the investigators ruled him out, but remember, we got the FBI involved because we have product tampering and now product tampering that re- resulted in a homicide. So the FBI comes in and they created this profile for what they believe the killer would be like. And like we spoke about, highly intelligent, a white male, roughly mid-30s, um, likes to resolve conflict without direct confrontation. So he's not going to come up to you in your face. And he probably liked to read and watch TV movies about murder. Boy, I hope they don't. I think we fit that profile. I know. Um, and obviously the, the, the killer would fantasize about committing this murder. Now, John Douglas, who we all know and love, said that this was very passive type of person, a cowardly type of person, very similar to a bomber's personality. Hashtag bring back my hunter. Bring back mind hunter. Yes. <laughs> so. So authorities soon discovered that the family had some issues with their only neighbors, the tree pals. George Trepal and his wife, Diana, had moved into their Alturas, Florida home during the early 1980s. Diana had a master's degree in chemistry and graduated from medical school as an orthopedic surgeon. George was a freelance writer for a computer magazine. Both were highly intelligent and were members of Mensa. Now, Mensa is the largest and oldest IQ society in the world. It is a nonprofit organization open to people who score in the 98th percentile or higher on a standardized supervised IQ or other approved intelligence test. I got that information from Mensa's website. You know, I've, I've sometimes, and not just me, but I've seen a, a I guess a, it was like not really a documentary, but it was like an episode of something where they talked about how having a really, really high IQ in today's society actually is a handicap because it's like you can't. Because you can't. You, you're you not lack able to. social skills. Exactly. You're not able to communicate with certain people because you you're on a higher level. And I don't mean that in any other way other than an intelligence level because your mind thinks of things so quickly, so rapidly that they basically dissect everything you say. So they're unable to communicate to where they almost seem like they're handicapped. So I, I'm just full of little fun facts tonight, aren't you I? Are, Look, I let me go with my little fun facts. Well, Pi Carr and Peggy Carr, who were married in early 1988, and now remember when they got married, Pi's home was the house that they're living in now, so Peggy moved in with Pi, which is the house that's located next to the tree poles, correct? Yeah. Now, Travis Carr, Pi's son, and Duane Duberly, that's Peggy's son, also resided at the home. Now, in March of 1988, George Trepow complained to the zoning board about Pi and said that he was constructing an apartment on his property. I guess he was... Uh, Pi was renovating their garage into an apartment, and this is where his daughters, Delana Shiver and Tammy Reed, and his granddaughter, Kelsey Bell, were residing at the time. So he was trying to turn this into an apartment. And Pi was cited by the zoning department for violation and was forced to abandon the project. So now George Trepaw has called the zoning committee, got him fined, shut down, if you will. So there's a little bit of animosity. And then in July, the Carr family receives this anonymous letter at their home addressed to Pi Carr. Now, Pi was spelled P-I-E, and Pi is a uh, is a shortened name. His name is actually it's, it's actually the way they spell it is P-Y-E, but his real name is Parilin. How do you say that? Parilin. Parilin. Yeah, Pyrilin? but it's P-Y-E. So Pi was spelled incorrectly. But and, okay, wait, no. So he he went by Pi, P-Y-E. Yes. But they got an anonymous letter to their house, which was addressed to P-I-E car. Right? Correct. Yeah, that's okay, what I was saying. Okay, I just want to make yep. sure. Okay. Yep. 
Well, it says on the note, this warning, if you will, it says, you and all your so-called family have two weeks to move out of Florida forever or else you all die. This is no joke. Now, most of the family dismissed the letter as a joke, but Peggy was nervous and warned her children to be careful. Now, one thing about this letter that's interesting is the letter correctly listed Pi's mailing address as being Bartow, Florida. Even though they lived in Alturas, the Pies and the Tree Pals home had Bartow mailing addresses because they got their mail on the Bartow post office route. Now, the only other person that would know that would be the Tree Pals. Hmm, interesting. So, you know, most people, if they were going to send Pi a letter, they would send it to Alturas, Florida. But Pi and the Tree Pals knew that they could address it to Bartow, Florida, because that it was on the Bartow mailing route. Interesting. Yes. So in October that year, Diana Treepal got into a heated argument with Peggy. The families had barely spoken, but on this day, Diana confronted Peggy's sons and complained about them playing music too loudly. When Peggy defended her boys, Diana stormed off, shouting, You won't get away with this. Now further, this is interesting here. George Treepal had been arrested in North Carolina in the mid-70s for running one of the largest meth labs on the East Coast. The drug agent who arrested George called him, quote, the smartest chemist he had ever known. He, so George ended up serving three years in federal prison after that. So he's no stranger to the rain. So in December 1988, investigators interviewed George Treepal. When asked why anyone would want to poison the cars, Treepal said perhaps someone wanted them to move out of their home. Investigators found Treepal's response eerily similar to the threatening letter. So Special Agent Susan Gorick was assigned to the murder investigation. She was tasked with going undercover and joining the Mensa group that George and Diana belonged to. Just as a quick note, do you... you you think how how tough that would actually have to be, because like I said a minute ago, you're you're going to have to infiltrate and deal with people that are work on such a higher educational level than what you would think that the average detective has. So this is not just okay, you're going to go undercover and you're going to act like you're a drug addict or you're a drug dealer or you're a murderer. This is someone who has to go in and act way more intelligent than maybe they are or maybe she wasn't. Who knows? Maybe she was. Maybe. But I'm just saying that just seems to me like it would be even tougher to accomplish. So kudos to her. Well, they called this Operation Pale Horse, a nod to the Agatha Christie novel titled The Pale Horse, in which the murderer used thallium to poison his victims. One of the couple's more intriguing hobbies, talking about the tree pals here, was their coordination of the Mensa Group's Murder Mystery Weekends. <laughs> By invitation only, the Tree Pals would set up play-acting homicides and lead their guests through a clue-by-clue investigation to solve them. A fan of fictional and real-life mysteries, let's go back to the uh, profile, Mm -hmm. Tree Pal prided himself on being an expert on crime scene procedures and studied police manuals to sharpen his skills for the Murder Mystery Weekends. So these Murder Mystery Weekends were put together by the Tree Pals? Yes. For the Mensa Club. Exactly, for the Murder Mystery Weekend. So Agent Gorick sent George Treepal a letter requesting an invitation to one of his Murder Mystery Weekends, calling herself Sherry Ginn and explaining that she was new to the area and was bored and looking for an intellectual challenge. Treepal answered her query with a registration form for the upcoming Mystery Weekend at the Winter Haven Holiday Inn. She attended this event and met George and Diana in person. Now, side note, one of the murder mysteries the group was tasked with solving that weekend, the one one of the ones that George Trepal had come up with, was a poisoning murder. Interesting. So George took a liking to Sherry, a.k.a. Agent Gorick, and the two ended up meeting up on several occasions. Once she went to George's home and saw in plain view on the coffee table 
The Pale Horse by Agatha Christie, the novel. Seriously? Yes. It, like, so- truth is stranger than fiction, right? I mean, is he like, is he like play acting Mensa? I don't know. Or maybe he's putting on the Mensa. I don't know. Maybe he's just pretending to be smart. <laughs> I don't know. Well, a year after Peggy Carr's death, George and Diana, they're going to move away. And they ended up renting their home to their new friend, Sherry, a.k.a. Special Agent Susan Gorick. As so, hold on. So, she rents the house. Yes. I mean, so maybe she is Maybe she is she, kind of mental. I, I get the impression that She's, Agent Susan Gorick is highly intelligent. I get that now. So, as soon as Special Agent Gorick moves into the home, the FBI moved in with her. They rubbed cotton balls dipped in nitric acid across the floor of a secreted room that Tree Pal had once shown Sherry. They swabbed the insides of the cabinets and sink drains, all in hopes of picking up traces of thallium. They searched the dusty, junk-filled garage. There, Agent Brick- Bricky found a dish pan containing several small bottles. The bottles, along with the cotton balls, were sent to the FBI lab in Virginia. The team found nothing obvious, no experimental Coke bottles, no labeled bottles of poison. So at this point, Susan Gorick had been working this case for more than a year, and she's beginning to, like, get worn down. A year? This is a year. Okay, so I, I didn't quite grasp that because it one of the problems I have sometimes in, in when you're dealing with the true crime timelines and – you're listening to the stories after the fact. It's hard to fathom the, the time frame it takes because now, you know, when you watch a 30 minute program at SVU, it's, you know, they got the suspect and we got to rush here and get this and we get that. And we get the material, then they send the stuff off. The DNA is tested. And, you know, later on that afternoon, it's, hey, we got them. And that just blows me away that it's a year now. Well, if you think about it, uh, Agent Gorick had to go undercover as Sherry Ginn. She had to meet the tree pals and befriend them. She had to meet with them on several occasions, become close with them, and close enough to where they would trust her, they would rent her their house when mm-hmm. they moved away. And based I mean, on that what, takes time. And based on what we've seen so far, we don't have any, we're not seeing anything with the wife at this point. No. Okay. No, not nothing. So Susan Gorick is wearing down. She's getting sick of it. Uh, she racks her brain for one more approach that might trip up Tree Pal. So she goes to Mincy and Brecky with an idea. She wanted to tell George that the FBI had come by the house looking for him and asking about poison. So in late January of 1990, Gorick called Tree Pal and said she had something important to tell him. They agreed to meet at a McDonald's restaurant in Sebring. That Sebring, this is where George and Diana had moved. Okay. And Sebring's not far, no. maybe 30 minutes tops. Uh, yeah, maybe. So a microphone hidden in Gorick's purse transmitted the conversation to a surveillance van parked nearby where agents were videotaping the meeting. This is all very movie-esque, like, like an FBI van well, in, the, but in remember, the parking lot. It's 1989, 88, 80, it's 80, 1989. 1990. 1990, sorry. It's 1990, so you're still you're not dealing with the internet. You're not dealing with uh, there's just there's so many things that you're not necessarily dealing with at this point where you can't just transmit into you know you can't record with your cell phone and somebody else can, you know what I mean. So I, it, it is very movie esque. So they're at this McDonald's restaurant, right? So Sherry, aka Susan, tells Tree Pal that two detectives had come to the house. And told her about a murder that happened to Tree Pal's neighbors in Alturas. And he replies, Oh, yeah, somebody got poisoned next door, he says, all nonchalant. And when Gorick handed him Mincy and Brecky's business card, Tree Pal's attitude changed. Well, of course, he realizes, Oh, shit, she's not joking. So George, who had always been very polite, all of a sudden gets very rude with her. And uh, states, I hope I'm not a prime suspect, because that could be messy. But other than that, Gorick's move had not shaken George Treepal enough for any type of confession or break in the case. And with no further progress in the case, 
she she's ready to give up. Detective Gorick was just like, I'm over this shit. Well, while she was talking with Brecky about her desire to quit the case, he put her on hold to take another call, and it was the FBI lab. And the very movie ask again. I mean, uh, hey, no, can you hold? Is, this is oh, like by the way, movie. hey, this is the lab. So this just kind of this is like an episode right here. Um, I'm gonna hear that little noise, <laughs> whatever that little SEU noise is. <laughs> well, the technicians from the FBI lab had found traces of thallium nitrate in the bottles that were taken from the Tree Pals garage. So the bottles that they got out of the Tree Pals garage. Now remember, Sherry had moved in there, so because she was given. Fair, fair range or free range, I should say, rather, of the house. Yeah. Remember, they were able to go in there without a search warrant. They could look for everything. Yeah, because so, she had a lease. And it was her, you know. So at this point, I mean, it's not like they went and served a warrant where if George Trepow was there, he'd be nervous, like, oh, shit, did they take this or that? So they sent him off to the lab. Now, unbeknownst to anyone, this, this, these things were found. They were sent to the lab. And now, finally, now, remember, this is a long time after they went through, and I mean, not a long time, but it's quite a while that they sent these bottles off. And now they're finally getting some results, and it hits. Boom. Yes. In the garage, the bottles you found contain the poisoning drug that we found in Peggy Carr's system. So on April 7th of 1990, Gorick, Brecky, and Mincy met with deputies from the Polk County Sheriff's Office near Tree Pal's new house on Lake Jackson in Sebring. Lake Jackson's beautiful, by the way. So Gorick, still posing as Sherry Ginn, called Tree Pal from a mobile phone and kept him on the line while FBI agents and officers moved in. This is it's such like a movie. It is. Brecky and Mincy walk up to the home's front door. When Diana Tree Pal answers their knocks, they identify themselves and ask to speak with George. Tree Pal is still upstairs on the phone with Gorick and said to the undercover cop, Sherry, by coincidence, the police are here. He told her to call back and hung up. Now, at the front door, Diana is livid, cursing the officers, trying to block their entrance with their with her own body. Um, It's the FBI, Karen. Step aside. <laughs> While a uniformed police officer physically restrained her, Mincy and Brecky entered the house with a search warrant. When Tree Pal appeared at the top of the stairs in bikini briefs... <sighs> They told him to get dressed and come down. Now, in the kitchen, they told him he was under arrest for the murder of Peggy Carr. Gorick sat in a car across the street watching. She didn't want to identify herself, believing that in her undercover guise, she might still pull in more information. What's well, smart? Because if, if he feels like she's not involved, like he can still confide in her, then he might call her or, you know, things like that, maybe write her a letter. Yeah, So exactly. it's a smart move. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's a smart move for her to like, look, don't get me involved. I'll pretend like I was never involved in this. I don't know anything because I just live here at this house that I rent from them. So I was on the phone with him. But as long as she doesn't know, you know, there could be more information coming. So that's a smart move. I think she, I think she's way smarter than maybe, you know, police detective work. But I'm kind of glad she was there for this. Mm-hmm. So now with both the Diana and George out of the house, Gorick... And the search team moves in, and they're going to start collecting some evidence. In an upstairs bedroom, they found S&M literature, leg irons, handcuffs, and whips. Everybody's got a kink, I guess. Yeah. Now, downstairs, Gorick found a police manual with a chapter titled Death by Poison and another book titled Poison Detection in Human Organs. Suspicious? Maybe. Now, before long, they discovered that a section of the wall was uneven at one end, an officer yanked at the pegboard section holding these set of tools, and it swung open, revealing a door that led to a room with a partially completed wooden platform the size of a bed with shackles attached. All the windows had been taken out, and the bedroom had been soundproofed. Creepy! Yeah, I know. Well, it wasn't, like... that, it wasn't that they just took the windows out. They literally blocked the windows. You could see on the exterior of the house, they blocked the windows and concreted it. I've seen pictures of the of of the home. Oh, that's yeah. creepy! And it, they literally like blocked it and just like filled it in. Wait a minute! Wait a minute! I got I got to rewind. What do you think that room was for? Kink. Maybe it was where they got. Maybe it was where but they got what the if they freak were, like, on. Planning on kidnapping somebody and keeping them in there with. So you're saying that maybe this this kept them from doing that, or maybe they had already done it before. Oh, 
I don't know. Well, they did do the murder mystery stuff, so I guess. Now, I never even thought about what the room was for. I was just figured it was when they did their, their freaky deek, the little kinky stuff with the whips and handcuffs. But now when you say that, that kind of makes me think that maybe something else was about to occur. Okay. I'm moving along. So police found chemistry books, including the Mark Index of Chemicals and Drugs, the Handbook of Chemistry and Physics, which contained chemical information on thallium, and the Fire Protection Guide on Hazardous Material, which contained a section on thallium compounds. Police also seized from the Trepal home a pamphlet written by Trepal called Chemistry for the Complete Idiot, a practical guide to all chemistry with pictures and index, many, many chemicals plus chemistry related glassware and equipment and a homemade journal described as a general poison guide. This journal, Trepal's journal, included photocopied pages from books titled Poison Detection in Human Organs, which we talked about earlier. One of the photocopied pages included a discussion on thallium. The journal was tested for fingerprints and was found to have only George Trepal's fingerprints on it, not his wife's. So finally, police found a bottle capping machine that could have been used to replace the bottle caps of Coca-Cola after the cap was removed to introduce the poison into the drink. Now, do you think that he had this from like his meth operation where they could move chemicals where he could... Like put the chemistry in Coke bottles and stuff like that, and move them around without being detected back in the seventies. Or do you no think that this idea. is why would he go get? It? I mean, do you think that he purchased a Coke bottle recapping machine to poison Peggy Carr? I can't imagine he would have gone that far. Although uh, he went pretty I, far. Yeah, I know. I just I'm said that. I made me sound real I stupid. I think <laughs> that that this individual was probably one of the sickest people. And we've talked about some pretty sick individuals, but this has got to be like to this. This is an extreme murder plot, right? Yes, exactly. But then again, he thrived on that murder mystery, so to him, this was probably arousing to him in the sense of he liked the mystery of it. Hey, I'm going to slide this note at the door. Hey, you know, move out of Florida, or everyone in your family dies. And then he, you know, in his mind, gets this murder mystery plot. So he was actually acting out one of his one of his murder mysteries, yeah. which like I said, might've been an arousal thing. And maybe this, maybe that's why they moved to the new house to build this little, whatever room that was going to be. Maybe it was going to be some torture room or experimental, experimental room. Who knows? Yeah. So yeah, you, it, this is definitely a, a creepy dude. Definitely. Just a quick, another quick question. How come the wife was never a suspect? I don't know. I don't know if she knew. I don't know what she knew. I really didn't find any information on that I, did, at I all. didn't either. I didn't see anywhere where I'm wondering where if maybe thought. she didn't know. Or maybe she... I mean, she seemed like kind of a... Biatch? Yeah, herself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I I get the impression that maybe she didn't know. Okay. Well, maybe he was also protecting her because, remember, she was a pretty, pretty. I don't want to say a high-ranking individual, but she was a, a surgeon. So it's quite possible that maybe he was just kind of protecting her. Who knows? Yeah, maybe. Maybe she didn't want to know. And and we, we hear this all the time. I mean, you look at some of the the classic murderers that they had these all alternative lives, alternative lifestyles, if you will, where... Like BTK. Well, yeah. that's a, You know, it's funny because me and you're on the same level because that's the first one I thought <laughs> of because his stuff was so weird and his family had no idea. So yeah. I guess it's possible that maybe the wife didn't know. So Tree Pal's trial ran from January 7th to February 7th of 1991. And on March 6th, 1991, George James Tree Pal was convicted and sentenced to death for the poisoning of his neighbor, Peggy Carr. He was also convicted of the attempted murder of the entire Carr family. Oh, yeah. According to this, I mean, there's uh, 15 counts. Yeah. But he was sentenced to death for the murder of Peggy Carr. And today, he awaits his pending execution on death row in the Union Correctional Institution in Rayford, Florida. Yeah, he's got six attempted first-degree murder charges, one of first-degree murder, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, food and poisoning water charges, 
and one count of tampering with consumer products. Each one of those, he was convicted for 30 years. So he, he ain't getting out. The murder was he was convicted for death, but every single one of those other ones, he was, he was convicted in 30-year sentence on each. So he, but he's still sitting up there on death row. So exactly. Well, when you look at the, when you look at this and you read this case, you do your research. If you find that he was, uh, the, it says here upon advisory sentencing, the jury nine to three majority voted for the death penalty. So if you're a juror or you're in the courtroom and you're a judge and and you, the, if the jury's hearing this and he gets conviction of thirty years for each one of these, they must have thought. Everything that they had, so all the evidence that we've presented was probably just a fraction of what was actually presented at trial, which is usually the case because you don't necessarily know, especially going back to that time. Right. It must have been very, very damning evidence and enough to make these people fear that this guy ever walked in the face of the earth again. Right. That, hey, well, let's get him in here. We got to be done with this guy. So I don't know. That's just that's just one of those where it's a really – the dude's a really creepy dude, but – he obviously scared the hell out of the judge and the jury. Yeah, I agree. And I'm glad he's locked up. Yep. Well, that's uh, that's our case from uh, Polk County. Again, if you'd like to support the show, please subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Paradise After Dark Podcast. And check out our website for links to all our social media, our Patreon. Hey, our merch store. Check it out. We got some cool new gear on there. Yeah, we do. And make sure to subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening on. And rate and review. This really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. And thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. To Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark.